Hello and welcome to this first module in what will become a short series of videos where we're working with Apache Spark. And this series of courses is designed in particular with Java developers in mind. Spark is a parallel execution framework which enables us to perform operations on big data sets in a highly parallel fashion. You might be familiar with Hadoop. Now this is still a very popular parallel execution framework which uses the map reduce framework to crunch big data sets. We've done a course on Hadoop already at Virtual Pair Programmers, so do check that out if you're interested. And it was a revolutionary technology, but it suffers from two problems. Firstly, it's a very rigid model. As we described on that course, you must do a map and then a reduce process, which is powerful, but maybe not suitable for all requirements. Well, definitely not suited for all requirements. Its second weakness is that if you have complex requirements, then you need to chain together map reduce jobs. And due to the way that Hadoop map reduce is designed, after one map reduce is finished, the results have to be written to disk and then reloaded into the next map task. So there's quite a hit on performance there. And that's why at the time of recording on the Apache Spark homepage, the very first thing they say is they're comparing themselves to Hadoop and they reckon that a Spark program can run up to 100 times faster than Hadoop MapReduce assuming that you can do the job in memory, or if your data is too big to fit in memory and you have to spill to disk, then you're still going to see a 10 times faster performance. So clearly, Spark kind of defines itself in comparison with Hadoop MapReduce. So speed's one thing, but how else is Spark different to Hadoop? Well, Spark is going to allow us to build much richer jobs and we can use combinations of not just maps and reducers, but also operations such as sorts and filters and joins. And well, actually, as they describe here, there's over 80 high level operators, meaning that we have a much richer set of tools than just map reduce. And the really mind blowingly clever thing about Spark is that rather than just stupidly doing one task after another, it actually builds something called an execution plan. And this is where it builds a graph representing the work that we want to do. And only when we're ready to get the data results that we want, will Spark actually run that execution plan. And this means it can perform really clever optimizations, such as it can spot that two parts of your process are not dependent on each other, therefore Spark can decide to run those two parts in parallel. But we don't have to think about that in the code. That will be spotted by the execution engine at runtime. Before we start coding, I think it's worth having a very high level look at the overall architecture of Spark. When you're working with Spark, you're going to be writing really regular Java programs, which you can run absolutely no problem on your local computer and it will run in a kind of a standalone mode. Here's an example. You don't need to understand any of what you see here. You will be building this code later on in the course. But I kind of want to draw your attention to just the general feeling of what's going on here is I'm doing various operations on a set of data pretty much in the same way that I would be operating on a set of collections in Java. I can run this program just as I would run a normal standalone Java program. There's no cluster here and the program ran. And this standalone mode, by the way, is actually really, really useful because when you run Spark on a single computer, you get the full benefits of multi-threading. And in fact, this Spark program will have been distributed across all of the available cores on my development computer. So I think this is often forgotten. Even if you're not working with massive big data, 
Obviously, big data is where the fashion is at the moment, but there's a lot of people benefiting from using Spark on relatively small data sets that they can efficiently program in a multi-threaded way on a single computer. Now, you could have done this using Java's threading, but if you've done any work with threading, you will know how dangerous and difficult it is. But with using Spark, you can get the full benefits of a multi-core parallel processing without having to think too deeply about threading. However, you may well be wanting to deploy this to a cluster, and we will be doing that on this course in chapter 11. If you do deploy to a cluster, then this is a rough overview of how things works. By the way, I am making some simplifications here just for the sake of clarity. Now, what will happen when we deploy to a cluster is the code that you've just seen will be uploaded to what's called the driver node, sometimes called the master node. Now, what this driver node will do is it will build that execution plan that we've been talking about. And it's a graph and it looks something like this. And later on in the course, we will be analyzing these graphs in some detail. But the point of this graph is it's Spark's way of trying to efficiently divide up the work so it can be processed in parallel. You're going to have probably at least two or as many as you like worker nodes, and these are physically separate computers. When this execution plan is complete, then presumably you're going to be loading in some sort of big data. You can use a Hadoop file system for this. Hadoop isn't redundant, by the way. What we're doing here is just replacing the MapReduce part of Hadoop, but we can certainly exploit a Hadoop file system. Or you might be reading your data in from something like Amazon S3. Now, what will happen is that data will be distributed across the worker nodes and will also be partitioned. Now, a partition is just a block of data. And typically, a node will have multiple partitions deployed to it. We'll talk much later about how the data is partitioned, but I do need you to be aware upfront that there is going to be this partitioning going on. Let's be clear about this. A partition is a block of data. A partition is not a node. Then what will happen as the execution plan is running is the driver will be responsible for farming out or sending across the network any Java functions that need to be executed against this data. Once these functions reach the worker nodes, then the functions will be executed against the partitions. So I don't know what this function might be. Let's say the function is a, let's say the function is a sort function, then the sort will be applied to each partition. And the worker is going to use as many parallel threads of execution as it has available to it. Another piece of Spark terminology is that when we have a function executing against a partition, we generally call that a task. You'll possibly see the term task and partition sort of used interchangeably if we're being a bit loose about things. But strictly a partition is just the data and a task is Java code that's executing on that partition. Now, all of the live architecture is quite complicated, but the code that we're going to write feels just like the code that you would have written against small data. One more piece of jargon in this chapter, and it's probably, well, it is the most important concept in Spark, at least until you start working with things like Spark SQL. The RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset. And, well, it actually depends who you're talking to as to what the RDD represents. For me, the way I think of the Resilient Distributed Dataset is, it is the data that we're working with. Now, we know now that that data is going to be distributed across multiple partitions, which are themselves distributed across multiple nodes. The resilient means that if any of the nodes fails, then the data that was present on that node can be recovered and recreated. But really, at least when we're starting, it's the distributed aspects of an RDD that's the, the important thing. 
So in the example I gave here, the RDD is an abstraction really. It doesn't really exist, but in my head, if I imagined this big set of data as being a single array, then that's the resilient distributed data set. I'm going to be working with the resilient distributed data set in the code. As you can see here on this line 28, I appear to have loaded in some kind of a text file, which could be a multi terabyte text file potentially. And you can see that I'm holding it in a variable here, which is called an RDD. And then I go ahead and do some operations on that RDD. And at each step, I'm getting a new RDD in response. Now, the reason I said it depends who you're talking to as to what an RDD is, is because although it looks like on this line here, I'm loading in the data into an RDD, and then on the next line, I'm doing some kind of an operation on that RDD to transform it by the look of it into a new RDD, and then I'm repeating the process all the way down here. You might be imagining if you just looked at this code that what we're doing all the way through is endlessly creating new RDDs. That sounds like it would be very wasteful because it looks like we're getting lots of copies of the data. But this is where Spark is clever and it is where and it does cause confusion this. In fact, when your program's running, all of these RDDs don't exist. After running this line of code, I've where I've asked Spark to load in a big data file, it's not going to load in a big data file. All it's going to do is add to its execution plan. And so what's really happening in your Spark code is that you're building an execution plan step by step. And when we get to the end, presumably you'll want something to happen at the end. Only then will Spark execute. And so really, it's quite confusing. It confused me for a long time. All of these objects that in the code we call RDD are actually just building blocks on the execution plan. And it's only really here at the end that physically in real life, that RDD is going to be constructed. Why am I telling you this now? And you certainly don't need to understand this code just yet. Well, I'm telling you now because for the most part of this course, we're going to be writing code like this and I'm going to be saying things like, hey, we're going to create a new RDD here and then we're going to do an operation and then we're going to transform that RDD and we get a new RDD called this and then we do something else and we get a new RDD. And that's the language I'm going to use and that's my mental model when I'm programming. But I want you to be aware in advance that when this thing actually runs and we will be analyzing performance in the last chapter, it's not really what's happening. We're building up an execution plan. Going back to the title slide for the course, what you're seeing here is a real life execution plan. We can visualize these using a web user interface in Spark that we'll be looking at in a later chapter. Oh, there is one more piece of jargon. I've been calling it the execution plan, but in a lot of the documentation, this is commonly called the DAG, which stands for Directed Acyclic Graph. It is just a jargon term for the execution plan. You might be familiar with Directed Acyclic Graphs from computer science. It just means a graph where there are connections between nodes on the graph. We can't go around in circles on the graph is all it means. It is a jargon term. You don't need to know about this in detail until towards the end of the course, I guess, but maybe it would be worth keeping in mind that all the time when your code is running, you're not really building data sets until the end. In fact, you're actually telling Spark to build a DAG. So for the first few chapters on the course, we're going to take things slowly. We'll do some basic Spark operations. We're going to do maps and reducers. We'll be looking at how to deal with pairs. We'll be doing tuples and filtering and flat maps. And we'll be doing sorting and how to read files. Then we'll put all of this together with a couple of big worked examples, which we'll be deploying to some live Amazon hardware. Throughout all of that work, as I say, generally try not to get bogged down in the under the hood stuff. It would be worth keeping in mind that there's this DAG going on underneath. 
and that the hard work only really happens towards the end of your code when something needs to be computed. But where possible, we'll keep our programmers head on. But then in the last chapter, we'll be switching focus and we'll get a better understanding of the DAG, the execution plan, and we'll make some optimizations and really get a better feel for what was going on all along. There will be another module later in the year covering Spark SQL or Spark SQL, which is a newer API, which is very popular and perhaps more widely used now than the core API that we're going to be learning on this module. But I think you do need to learn the core API before you move on to Spark SQL. One of the things, Spark is implemented in Scala, which is why probably most programmers using Spark are programming in Scala. But there is also an API for Python programmers and, of course, one for Java. Now, I must admit that due to the nature of Spark, if you wanted to program it in anything up to and including Java 7, then I'm not going to lie to you, it was a horrible experience. What one line of Scala code could achieve? Well, you would need 10 lines of Java and it would look like an explosion in a curly bracket factory. But since Java 8, we can now use Lambda functions, which for me is the only way to work in Java Spark. I would never consider the old way. So if you're new to Java 8 Lambdas, then I reckon this course is going to be a great way of getting some experience with them. So I hope you'll enjoy the ride. At the time of recording this course, Spark does not support Java 9. So unless that's changed by the time you watch this, you will need to be using a Java 8 compiler for the course. So I reckon that's enough for the introduction. In the next chapter, we'll get started with installing Spark.